Well, hey, good morning, Stone Creek. Man, if you have a Bible, you can go ahead and grab it. Open up to Jonah chapter two. Jonah chapter two, that's where we will be this morning. Anybody excited to be in church today? Man, I am excited to be here with you guys. Today, we continue a collection of talks, a series of messages on the book of Jonah. And um, to start that out, I wanna ask you this question. Have you ever been in over your head? Have you ever been in over your head? The answer to that question should be yes if you're older than eight, right? You've likely found yourself in over your head. Um, Being in over my head would be like an understated way to describe the first time I hit the ski slopes, okay? The first time I hit the ski slopes, I had absolutely no clue what I was doing. Any skiers in the crowd this morning? Any skiers? What is wrong with you people? Do you have like no regard for human life? I'm out there, I've got no clue what I'm doing. I end up going snowboarding, so I've got this instrument of torture strapped to my feet. And for the first 15 minutes, I just look like I'm looking for a lost contact lens, right? Like just trying to get my balance, like where is it? Um, So I'm, I'm with this group of people, and since I'm a newbie, I recommend that we start on the green slopes, you know, the easy ones with the cute names like Pop Tart. Those are the slopes that I wanna start on. However, they think they all belong in the X Games, so they wanna start on the double black diamonds. Now, if you're not a skier and you don't know what the double black diamonds are, the double black diamonds are the ski slopes that go like beyond challenging to the point of those possibly, like those people wanting to die. I'm serious, like I felt like I needed to stand at the double black diamonds and offer counseling sessions as a pastor. Like, how's your marriage? Are you sure you wanna go down? Like, do you have a death wish? Like these things are terrifying. And so I try to talk these people out of it. I try to talk some things in them. I go, hey guys, listen, I really think Like if we just started on Pop-Tart, okay, worked our way into it, kind of see how that went. They go, nope, we're starting on the devil's spinal cord. Let's go. And I was like, what? The devil's spinal cord? That seems scary. No, 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 no. Let's not start on the devil's spinal cord. I tell you what, if we start on Mother Goose, (laughs) sort of goes into Peekaboo and then down to Pillow Town, which feels tricky, but not treacherous. And they go, nope, we're starting on Hitler's mustache. Come on, here we go, two by two. And so I end up on the top of Hitler's mustache, people, my first time snowboarding. And so there I am, instrument of torture strapped to my feet. It is blizzarding, okay, blizzarding. So much snow coming down that I can't see five feet in front of me and I'm supposed to go down this hill, okay? Now, it's my first time snowboarding, so I'm also like in all of the snow gear, like an unnecessary amount of snow gear. I'm sweating and I'm not sure if I'm like sweating due to the anxiety or if I'm just sweating due to sweating, you know, like, That is where I'm at. And so here I am, scared out of my mind, in over my head, bitten off more than I can chew, terrified, but I can't tell anybody, right? I can't tell anybody that I'm scared because I was born with this disease called being a man. And so what do I do? Like any man, act like I know what I'm doing. I point the nose of the board towards the bottom of the mountain and I take off. Now, problem, apparently when you snowboard, um, you're either naturally left foot forward or you're naturally right foot forward. And this determines all your balance and your control and whether or not you're going to survive. My friends didn't tell me that until I got to the bottom of the mountain. And so here I am going down this mountain. I am gaining speed out of control. No idea how to stop. I am naturally right foot forward, but I'm going down the wrong way. I'm going down left foot forward. So the whole thing's just snowballing out of control, but um, right, that's where this whole thing is headed. And so all of a sudden I'm picking up speed and I end up hitting a mogul. Now, if you don't know what a mogul is, a mogul is this implanted snow hill designed to kill first time skiers. That's what a mogul is. And so I hit this mogul with so much speed that I launch into the air, into the posture that it looks like I'm saying, Jesus, take the wheel. Like that's where I'm at. I go so high, I hit a tree, I land off the trail in the snow, upside down with my snowboard in the air. A snow patrol girl, mind you, had to come and pull me out of the snow, hook me up behind her sled for the ride of shame all the way down the mountain. That's in over your head, people. That is in over your head. And and here's the truth. We've all got stories like that, right? We've all got stories where we're supposed to be on peekaboo, but we wound up on Hitler's mustache where we're looking around and we're going, man, how did I get here? Like, I got ahead of myself. I don't think I belong. But in much more than funny stories, we've got real life stories like that too. Man, we've got moments in life where all of a sudden we were left wondering, how did I get here? Like, how am I here in my career right now? 
Like, how did my marriage get to this place? How am I in debt up to my eyeballs? Like, we found ourselves in a situation where the outcome seemed inevitable and defeat seemed certain. And we were like, where do I go? What do I do? Who do I turn to? The diagnosis is bad. Alternative medicine isn't working. I'm addicted to painkillers. I've foreclosed on my house. My family has isolated me. Friends have abandoned me. Where do I go? What do I do? Where do I turn? I'm in over my head. If you've lived any amount of life, you found yourself there where you feel like you're in over your head and you are proverbially drowning. Well, I've got good news for you this morning. Where we pick up our story today, Jonah is in over his head and he is literally drowning. Like literally, like in the ocean, in the sea, seaweed over his head, no arm floaties, drowning, drowning. And it's from this place of drowning that Jonah shows each and every runaway what our right response should be if we're ready to come back home. He shows us how to get out when we've gotten in over our head. And so if you pulled into church this morning because you're looking for your last resort, you've come to the right place. If you've got some area of your life that you're like, I don't know how I'm going to fix this. I've exhausted all my resources, come to the end of all my wits. I've exercised all my senses. I've done all I know to do. I want for you to know you've come to the right place because today Jonah is going to show us how to get out when we've gotten in over our head. To catch you up on the story in Jonah chapter one, we see that Jonah is a runaway. Jonah's running from God. Jonah's a prophet of God. And Jonah is in a place called Joppa. Let me hear you say Joppa. And from Joppa, God tells Jonah that he needs to go to Nineveh, which is 500 miles away. But Jonah doesn't wanna go to Nineveh because Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. And Assyria are some of the most hood rat, terrible gangster people on the face of planet earth. They literally make pyramids of heads and invent ways of killing people. They're they're terrifying. You couple that with the reality that Jonah is a racist. He wants nothing to do with these people, does not believe that they're worth being saved. And so God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh. Jonah goes, uh, God, you're breaking up, can't hear you. And he goes 2,500 miles away to a place called Tarshish. 2,500 miles away to a place called Tarshish. And isn't this exactly how disobedience works? It's so funny. God tells Jonah to go 500 miles away to Nineveh, but he goes 2,500 miles away to a place called Tarshish. It's funny that sometimes we've got to work harder to disobey God than to do the thing he told us to do in the first place. Like, isn't it crazy? Like, if we spent half the time exhausting all the energy, using all the creativity that we exercise to disobey God, if we put that same amount of effort into just doing what he told us to do in the first place, life would be a whole lot easier. 500 miles is a whole lot shorter than 2,500 miles. Guys, I want for you to know I'm preaching way better than you're responding right now. <laughs> and so, and so like this is, this is what God is. This is what he's, he's, he's done is he's told Jonah, hey, go to Nineveh. But Jonah has hopped on a ship and he has gone to Tarshish and he is 2,500 miles away from where God has told him he is supposed to be. And he is in the middle of an ocean and he is drowning. You see, God had sent a storm, which caused Jonah to get thrown from the ship. And now Jonah is sinking in the middle of this ocean. While Jonah is sinking out of nowhere, this whale, this big giant fish comes and eats Jonah up. Now, let me pause. Don't make too big of a deal about the whale. Everybody freaks out over the whale. They lose their mind over the whale. Don't make a big deal about the whale, okay? The whale is just an ancient Hebrew form of Uber, okay? That's all the whale is. It's an ancient Hebrew form of Uber. It's just God's way of getting Jonah where Jonah's supposed to go, okay? That's what the whale is. People freak out over the whale. Now, let me do the disclaimer because I know you're wondering. You're like, Joey, do you really believe? Do you really believe that homie spent three days and three nights in a whale? Like, you seem like a guy who operates with at least some level of intellectual integrity. You talk about Jesus maybe different than I've heard before, and so I'm tracking with you. I'm digging this Christianity thing for the first time, but the whale, I don't know if I can deal with the whale, bro. All right, let me tell you how I make sense of the whale. Okay, this is how I make sense of the whale. Um, In Matthew chapter 12, this is what Jesus says. He goes, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Okay, so Jesus says, just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so the son of man will be in the earth for three days and three nights. So Jesus believes that Jonah was in the belly of the whale. Now, here's why I believe Jesus. This is just me. This is just my personal preference. This 
just how I tend to operate. This is my rule of thumb. This is my like code of ethics. If you predict your own death, if you say how you're gonna die, when you're gonna die, and then you actually die at that time in that way, rise from the dead, live to tell about it, I just trust you. <laughs> like I just do, right? Like, I'm just like, uh, yeah, you died, whatever. The whale thing, that seems like an easy obstacle to overcome. And so if Jesus believes that Jonah was in the whale, I believe that Jonah was in the whale for three days and three nights. And how it happened, I don't know. I'm not gonna do this whole, sperm whales are huge. I'm not gonna go that route with you. I'm gonna say it was miraculous. It was amazing. It was ridiculous, but God did it. And so Jonah is in the belly of a whale for three days and three nights when he begins to pray. Now, here's the thing about Jonah's prayer is um, he didn't have any pad or paper in the belly of a whale. So he's actually writing this after the fact. He's looking back on his his life many years later, and he's recalling this experience. And this is how he writes about it. Jonah chapter two, verse one. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the belly of the fish. Now I want for you to, like if you underline in your Bible, if you're like holy enough to do that, I want for you to underline belly of the fish, okay? We're gonna come back to that later on. It's gonna be really important. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out, to the Lord. Now, Lord there, that's like the personal name of God. He's speaking directly to him, personal with him. Like, I know you. I'm talking to you. Listen to me. I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, and you heard my voice. Now, that word Sheol is literally translated hell. So Jonah goes, I'm in hell on earth right now. I am in over my head right now. I am sinking deep right now, as bad as it could get. I, I've gone the wrong way, down the mountain. I've spiraled out of control and I am stuck and I'm living in hell. And that may be where your life is at right now. And from that place, Jonah calls out to the Lord in his distress and he says, the Lord answers him. He says, you heard my voice for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas. And the floods surrounded me, all your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me, weeds were wrapped around my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O oh Lord, my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah upon the dry land. That's amazing. Now, before we go any further, I just do want to reference what happens in verse 10 there. Um, I think it's so interesting that God speaks to Jonah and he says, hey, go to Nineveh. God said, Jonah says, no, thanks. God speaks to the fish. Hey, vomit Jonah out. And the fish listens to God. Like how funny is it that the fish, the whale is more obedient. He's, the, the fish is more holy than the prophet Jonah. Like that's crazy. No, but, but, but this is how it works, right? All of creation obeys God. He tells the mountains to grow and they grow. He tells the trees to bloom and they bloom. He tells the stars to shine and they, and they shine. He tells the ocean to stop this far, but he tells us to go and we have the audacity to look at him and say no. It's wild. It's wild, but the fish is more holy than the prophet and the whale spits Jonah out onto dry land. It's crazy, it's wild. Now, if you're taking notes, this is the first thing that I want for you to write down. Write this down. Surrender is the right response for the runaway. Surrender is the right response for the runaway. Up to this point in the story, all Jonah has been trying to do is control the situation. Control, control, control. How many of you are control freaks in the crowd? It's so funny to see them. They're like, yes, I will control this too. <laughs> That's what Jonah has been doing, man. He's just been trying to control. God tells him to go to Nineveh. He goes to Tarshish. God tells him to pray. He sleeps. He's got an opportunity to literally to have the sailors turn the boat around and go back to Nineveh. He goes, no, I'm gonna control this situation too. I would rather die than do what God tells me to do. Just throw me overboard. 
Like that, that is running, that is controlling, that is far from God. When you say, I would rather die than pray, I would rather die than be obedient, all Jonah's been doing in chapter one is running, 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 controlling, 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 but then you get to one turn of the page, one turn of the page, and in chapter one, I would rather die than pray, chapter two, it's nothing but a prayer. What a transformation. How crazy is that? Like where does this transformation come from? Jonah is like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. Like, how do you change this much overnight? Like, Jonah's like my wife after she's had a cup of coffee. She's a different woman, y'all. Like, Jonah's, he's just changing, transforming overnight out of nowhere. I will not pray. God, I'm running from you. I want nothing to do to, with you. To all of a sudden, it's this whole chapter of nothing but prayer. Like, where does that come from? How does that kind of transformation occur? I'll tell you how that kind of transformation occurs. Reckless love creates revolutionary change. Reckless love creates revolutionary change. When you start to understand the reckless, the hunt you down, run you down, chase you down, do whatever it takes, go, to, go over any obstacle, will not give up, will not quit, always coming after you, love of God that... That, that exists for you and I, there's no way you can't surrender. You surrender to that. When you see it live, living, in color, up close, personal, when you get God's love for you, you surrender, man. You lay it down. This is how love works, right? Like We know this. Like If somebody will chase after somebody long enough, they'll just give in to the love. This is the way that it worked for me and my wife, Kayla. This is the way it worked, man. When she started to realize that like when it came to me, she had two options. She could either marry me or file a rest restraining order. She married me because it was less paperwork, right? Like that's what she did. Like I, I wore that girl down and eventually she said yes. Man, we hit this point in our relationship because um, we're high school sweethearts. And so we get to this point in our relationship where she like freaks out because she's like, this is too real, too fast, let's break up. And so we break up. I really just think it's because she knew I was going into ministry and she's like, no thanks. <laughs> so we, we break up, right? And we're broken up. And so what do I do, man? I chase after her. I write that girl a love letter every single day for a year. Guys, I'm just kidding. Ryan Gosling did that in the notebook. Calm down. <laughs> but how great of an illustration would that have been? Could you imagine if I did that? Every woman in the room was just like, Punching her husband, idiot. <laughs> no, I didn't do that. It would have been awesome if I did. <laughs> but what I did do, this is what I did. I wrote my girl, I wrote her a 10 page love letter. I did. And man, I just poured my heart out to that girl. I was like writing poems in it. I was like, I'm never giving up on you. You can't run away from me. It, it sounded soccerish, okay? It did. Like it really did. But I was like, I love you. I'm committed to you. I will wait for you. Like I don't care. It doesn't matter how long. I'll wait for you. And I waited for a year. I would text her, I would call her, I would hit her up on MySpace because it was 2008, right? <laughs> Whatever I needed to do to show her that I was still committed, that I still loved her, that I was still there for her, that I was still chasing after her. And eventually she either came around to her senses or realized there was no better options in Auburn, Alabama. And we got married. But this is what love does. And this is exactly what God does for Jonah. God hunts him down, runs him down. And what Jonah starts to do is he starts to have this realization moment. He starts to see that all the storms, that all the obstacles, all the seaweed, all the drowning, everything that's surrounding him has actually been God orchestrating, has actually been God pursuing, has actually been God chasing him down to prove to him how much he loves him. And, and it looks outlandish at first. It looks like, God, how could you do this? But this is how stalkerishly in love with Jonah he is. And when Jonah sees it, when Jonah gets it, when, when he starts to snap out of it and see God's love, he, it, it leads to surrender. This is what's happening in verses two and three. He says, for you, God, cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves, your billows passed over me. So he sees that his surrounding circumstance, his present situation, that that is brought on by God that God is the one who's put him in the ocean, that God is the one that's got him drowning, that God has got the, him the one who's in over his head. God's put him there, and he's put him there so that Jonah would realize this. Then I said, I'm driven away from your sight. Yeah, I shall look again upon your holy temple. He's got this moment where he realizes that his present situation, that is not what he's focused on. He's focused on the fact that he is not in the presence of God anymore. 
He's not close to him. And that all God's been trying to do is trying to get, get Jonah back to him, trying to bring him back home, trying to rescue the runaway, trying to run after the runaway, trying to do whatever it takes to get Jonah's attention. Jonah gets it. He understands. He realizes God's reckless love for him, and it leads to revolutionary change. He surrenders. He surrenders this, no way, I'm not interested, I'm running, I won't do what you tell me to do. Prophet turns to God, what I vow, I, like I'll do it, wherever you, wherever you want me to go, I'll go, I love you, I'm for you, I'm with you, I'll pray to you, all I want is you, where does it come from? It comes from him seeing the reckless love of God. And some of you, you wanna change so badly. You're like, why can't I surrender? Why can't I give up this sin? Why can't I step into what God has asked me to do with my life? Why can't I get back home? Why can't I stop running? Why do I feel so trapped by the run? And it's because you don't see God's reckless love for you. You don't need to focus more on obedience. You need to focus more on the cross. You need to focus more on Jesus and what he's done to prove his love for you. You need to get your eyes on the Savior and his saving grace and his saving pursuit. You need to begin to see that all of the little puzzle pieces of your life, that what they say when you step back to look at them is that God's been chasing after you every step of the way from the day that you were born. You're in a Christian church right now, listen to a Christian message, because God is chasing after you. It's not coincidence, it's not accident. And when you see it, when you understand it's reckless, ridiculous, do whatever it takes, love, it leads to revolutionary change. Jonah surrenders. He surrenders to God and Surrender is this, okay? I'm gonna define surrender this way. Surrender is prayer plus praise. Prayer plus praise equals surrender for Jonah. It's the first thing Jonah does is he prays. And it's not a sophisticated prayer. It's not a religious prayer. It's not a calculated prayer. It's not a put together prayer. It's a very simple prayer. All Jonah pray prays from in the sea, we get one word, one word, and it's help. Check it out. He says this, in my distress, I called to the Lord. And he answered me, from deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. So this is Jonah calling out to God from the sea. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but people can't talk really well when they're trying to tread water. If you ever talk to somebody at a cookout when they're trying to tread water, you're like, what do you want to eat? They're like, oh, I have to, I have to. Like, you get like every fourth word because you can't say much when you're treading water. And when Jonah's in over his head in the deep of the sea, all he can say is help. God, I need your help. God, where are you? He prays to God. It's not sophisticated. It's not religious. And, and I want for you to know that God is ready to hear some of you pray to him again. Like some of you guys who are runaways, it feels so hard to pray, so challenging to pray, so difficult to pray. You don't wanna pray. I don't know if it's because you're afraid of the emotion that you'll find there. If you feel guilty, dirty, like he will not hear you, will not respond to you, but you don't wanna pray. You avoid prayer. You turn away from prayer. You even pretend like you're praying when you're not praying. You're surrounded by people who are praying. People are praying for you, but you're doing everything that you can to not pray. And I don't know why. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's your pride. I don't know if it's because it's, it's this realization that you have messed up and you have blown it and that you do need God. But the first response of a runaway is to pray, is to pray. And here's the truth is that God does not need sophistication. He does not need some genie in a bottle moment where you come up with this perfect calculation of what to say and then he will respond. He will deal with your brevity if you will bring your realness. It can be short, it can be simple, it can be sweet. It can be, God, help me. I surrender. And he'll respond. He can deal with your realness. Did you know that? That God can deal with your realness? He can deal with your realness. He doesn't need you to act like you've got it all together and, oh, Lord, oh, most high, holy God in the sky. Like, he doesn't need that. He doesn't. He just wants to hear your heart. He just wants for you to be real and bring him your real concerns. He sees them anyways, he knows where you're at. You're, you're, you're not fooling him. And so if you'll just really come to him and you'll surrender and you'll go, God, for the first time in my life, I'm saying it. I need you. Help me. Get me back on uh, a track. Restore me. Move me. I, I need you. You'll see him start to do ridiculous things. I have to do this all the time. All the time. I have to pray to God when I've realized that I've run from him all the time. If you spend any time with me, you'll, you'll quickly learn the most consistent prayer I pray is God, restore to me the joy of your salvation. 
I pray it all the time. I pray it in our staff prayers. I pray it with my wife. I pray it with my daughter. I pray it when I'm driving in the car. God, I need you to restore to me the joy of your salvation. It's a prayer that David prays in the book of Psalms. God, restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. So contrary to popular belief, I am not always this jacked up on Jesus juice, okay? Like I'm not, like this is the me that you get to see and I try to be the most real me up here that I am off stage. I, I try for sure 100%, but my wife, she gets to see the, like, like all of me, right? She gets to see the me on Tuesday when I'm like, I don't wanna preach. These people aren't gonna listen anyways. I don't feel like I've got any, anything to say. I don't wanna get alone with God and his word again. I'm stressed, I, I, I feel far from him. I, I feel guilty for sins that I've committed and, and I've gotta go and I've gotta pray and I've gotta go, God, restore to me the joy of your your salvation. Remind me that you've saved me and rescued me and redeemed me. Remind me of how bloody the cross is, of how big the cross is, of how beautiful the cross is. And what starts to happen is I start to realize that there's people who don't know about the cross yet. And all of a sudden it reignites this passion when I begin to pray. And some of you, that's what you need to do. The first step that you need to take as somebody who's run away from God is you just need to get real and honest and raw and pray and call out for help and ask him to restore your salvation and just see what he does. This is Jonah's first response as a runaway. This is, this is, what, this is the path he sets for us if we wanna get out. Now, the rest of Jonah chapter two is really crazy because that's Jonah's prayer in the sea. And Jonah's prayer in the sea, we just see one word, help, and then the rest of his prayer is his prayer from a different place. It's his prayer from kind of in the middle, kind of in the in-between. And it's honestly, quite frankly, one of the most wild, interesting, all over the place prayers in the whole Bible. And what makes it so interesting is where it happens is that it, it happens while Jonah is in the whale. So you see, Jonah's in the whale, but when you read the prayer, it sounds like he's already on dry land. Like, so I'm reading through this prayer and Jonah's saying things. He's like, you brought my life up from the pit with shouts of grateful praise, I will sacrifice to you. Salvation comes from the Lord. And as I'm looking at it, I'm like, Jonah, I admire your optimism, bro, but you're in a whale. Like, I don't know that he has brought your life up from the pit. It's actually worse than a pit. You're in a stomach, right? Like, I don't know if I'm in a whale's stomach if I'm like shouting praise. I don't know if I'm like gratitude and happy and God, you brought my life up from the pit. I don't know if that's my posture inside a whale. Like, like think about being a whale for a second. Like, if I'm inside a whale, the thing I'm praying is, give me the heck out, right? I'm like knocking on the whale's stomach. I'm like speaking whale, hey! right? Whatever it takes. That's more dolphin than whale. I don't think that was a whale, right? Well, <laughs> but whatever, I don't know. I'm whatever it takes for God to listen to me or the whale to listen to me, just get me out of here. But that's not Jonah's posture at all. Jonah's inside of the whale and he's got a completely different posture. And I think there's a really important lesson that we need to learn from Jonah when we've run away. When we've run away from God, we have to learn to welcome the whale. When you've run away from God, when you're in over your head and you're trying to get back home, you're trying to get back on track, you've got to learn to welcome the whale. I want for you to know that between the sea that you feel like you're in, between the over your head situation that you're living in right now, dead up to your eyeballs, marriage in shambles, nowhere to turn, between your sea and your dry ground, there is oftentimes a whale. There is something that is going to get you from where you are to where God wants you to be. And, and sometimes we've got these like crazy, unrealistic, unbiblical expectations of God. We've made a mess of our life. We've trashed everything. We've run thousands of miles away from where we're supposed to be. We've turned our back on him. We've got seaweed everywhere. We are sinking ships. We say one prayer and we think God's supposed to snap his fingers like a genie and get us back to where we're supposed to be. We think like little, okay, God, I surrendered to you. And so now I'm supposed to be back on track. Although I've run away from you for the last 27 years of my life, I say one thing and I'm supposed to be 37 years in the other direction. And it's ludicrous, it's crazy, it's ridiculous. It's, it's child's play. It's, it's nowhere in the Bible that that's the way that it's going to work. Jonah 
gets grateful for the whale. And he's grateful for the whale because he remembers where he was. He remembers. He remembers like, hey, just a second ago, like I was sinking deep in my sin. I was drowning. The waves were crashing over me. I mean, this is literally how he reads, how the most, most of the prayer reads. He goes, I caught out to the Lord out of my distress, out of the belly of Sheol, for you cast me into the deep and the heart of the seas and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and billows passed over me. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. When my life was fainting away, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. Jonah re remembers where he was and it makes him welcome the whale. It makes him get really grateful for it. And here's the truth is some of you guys are in a situation right now. You're in a period of your life where you feel like it's living in a whale. Like, like, imagine that for a second, right? It's dark in a whale. Like, it's probably murky in a whale. It's gross in a whale. Like, in a whale, you, you, you're probably wondering, like, have I died? Like, is this the end? You probably can't move very much. To top it all off, it probably smells great, right? That's like inside a whale. And so you're there right now in your life. You're like, okay, yeah, I was sinking, but now I feel like I'm in a whale. And all you want to do is get out of the whale. You're so discontent with where you're at. You're a student and you just want to be in college. You're single and you just want to be married. You're, you're not pregnant and you want to be pregnant. You're, you're somewhere and you feel like your situation's a whale. And, and this is what we've got to realize is that if we'll just be a little patient, if we'll just hold on for, for just a second, just three days and three nights for Jonah, if we'll just have a little bit of faith, then we'll begin to realize that yes, we're inside a whale, but whales move. Whales swim, whales can transport, and the very thing that looked like your destruction is now transporting you to your destiny. We will see that this whale that we didn't want to be in, that we were trying to escape, that we were scoffing at God for, is actually the very thing that's going to deliver us to exactly where we're supposed to be to accomplish the destiny that God has placed on each and every one of our lives. What if we started to just welcome the whale, to embrace the whale, to be grateful for the whale? We waste so much time wishing the whale away. Waste so much time wishing the whale away where if we would just begin to subtly shift, to subtly change, and to do what Jonah does in the whale, which is worship, then our situations would start to change because our perspectives would start to change. So, so watch how Jonah closes out this prayer. It's so, it's so wild. It's the thing I've struggled with most all week long preparing for this. Verse eight, he says, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Now, as I read that this week, I'm like reading it seven times, forward and backwards. I'm like looking at commentaries, just struggling with this. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. That's the phrase that I just can't get past. I'm like, Jonah, how can you say that? Like, I'm, I'm looking at the statement that he makes, which if I were to sum up that statement, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. This is how I would sum it up. If you run from God, if you run from God, you forfeit God's reckless love. That's what he's saying. If you've run from God, you forfeit God's reckless love. And I'm like, Jonah, bro, how in the world can you say that? Like, are you throwing shade at the sailors right now who prayed to their vain idols when you were crutched down in the bottom of the boat sleeping? Is that what you're doing right now? Like, Jonah, are you talking trash already? Like, are you calling out Nineveh? What is happening here? Because I'm, I'm so confused because just a second ago, you were the one who was holding on to vain idols, you were the one who held on to the idol of your comfort, who held on to the idol of your plans, who held on to the idol of what you wanted to do and who forfeit what God told you to do. So how in the world right now are you saying that those who pay regard to vain idols forfeit his love? It's, it's like mind blowing to me. It's messing me up. I don't understand how in the world Jonah can make this statement right now. And then I start to realize that what Jonah is doing is, Jonah is starting to praise God. He's starting to worship God. And as he's starting to praise God, Jonah's perspective is starting to shift. 
This is what happens. When you run away from God and you start to praise God, your perspective starts to shift. And one of the most important things happens that needs to happen in the life of a runaway. And it's this, is you begin to be able to see past your past. You begin to be able to see past your past. When you begin to praise God, your perspective starts to shift and you're able to see past your past. You see, I'll talk to runaways all the time. And they're like big hang up with God. Like their big difficulty to overcome is like they've understood that God sent the storm. They've understood that God loves them and cares for them. They've said yes to following him again, but they just can't see past all these mistakes that they've made. They're like, oh man, there's no way that God could use me. No way that God could love me. Do you see what I've done? Do you see all the damage that I've caused? I'm an idolater. I'm a liar. I'm an adulterer. I've run from God. There's no no way he can restore this. No way he can make this right. They're like Jonah. They're like, yeah, I am an idolater. So there's no way that I'm worthy of God's love. And there's no way that I can be a part of God's plan. But as Jonah starts to praise, as Jonah starts to worship, his perspective starts to shift and he starts to get his eyes on the reality that salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord, that it is God's It is God's doing, salvation is, that God determines who he saves, how he saves, why he saves, when he saves. He'll do whatever he wants in salvation, rescue any runaway from any sin, no matter how far they've gone. And and when he does that, he sets their feet on new ground, gives them a new identity, changes everything about them. And so literally with the flip of a page, I go from runaway rebel to rescued and redeemed. I go from, yeah, I've turned my back on God and yeah, I've got baggage to, hey, God, I'm ready, I'm prepared. I will use my sword to go anywhere you send me to tell people about your salvation. This is what happens to Jonah as he starts to praise, as he starts to worship God, he gets his eyes off of his sin and onto his savior. And we're so horrible at this, so horrible at this in our culture. Like we think that this worship time, we're not really sure what's happening here. And I want for you to know that what we're, what's happening in praise, what's happening in worship, what's happening when we sing is, is we're allowing the truths that we know in our head to move to our heart. We're allowing these intellectual ideas to somehow get into the fabric of who we are so that we can believe them. <clears throat> Men are the worst at this. Like it gets to the singing part and it's like, all right, I'll go get my kids now. But this is actually the part where the Holy Spirit wants to come in and do a work that I can't do through preaching, that I can't do through intellectual unpacking, that I can't make you laugh hard enough, cry hard enough to motivate you to do. And that's, that's, that's repentance. That's a change of mind, a change of heart, a change of how you see yourself and how you see God. And so when we pray, just something deeply spiritual happens where God just begins to move. He starts to orchestrate. He starts to rework, shift our perspective. We're able to see our past, our past, and step into our destiny. We start to see that just like in the story, God doesn't condemn Jonah and God doesn't condemn you anymore. Stop living in so much condemnation, runaways. That just like God doesn't give up on Jonah, God doesn't give up on you, runaways. That just like God does not remove his love from Jonah, God does not remove his love from you. Just like God is not tired of Jonah, he is not tired of you. Just like God is not done with Jonah, God is not done with you. You've still got a destiny. And if you'll begin to praise, your perspective will shift and you'll get prepared to step into what God has for you next. So this is what we're gonna do. Just like Jonah worships, we're gonna worship. In a second, we're gonna stand over this room and there's gonna be a time for us to get our eyes off of all the garbage that we've done, all of our mistakes, all of our running, all of our Tarshish moments and to get them on our savior, on the God of salvation, who rescues, who redeems on Jesus and his cross and his blood poured out for us so that we can step into what he has for us next. Let's pray, Jesus, I love you and I'm thankful for your word. And I know that there's runaways all over the room this morning who have just been running in every way that they can, trying to evade you, trying to escape you, trying to dodge you. God, I pray for for those of us who are doing it subtly and so we feel comfortable with it, God, I pray that this morning would be a moment of surrender. God, that we would surrender, that we would see your reckless, ridiculous love and that it would lead to this revolutionary change for each and every one of us. That we would begin to pray, we would begin to call out for you. 
begin to ask you to help us, to restore us, to give us the joy of our salvation so that the passion can come back again. And God, I pray that we would begin to praise even when we don't want to, that we would sing with our mouths so that our hearts would begin to believe, that our perspectives would begin to shift, that our pasts could be buried, thrown into the ocean and forgotten about so that we could get to the destiny of where you've got us going next. God, I just pray for all the freedom in this place this morning, and I pray for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. I invite you to stand as we worship together.